I only take care of this pet for Abbas. Why do we need to have this meeting? What Jujin said is indeed correct, making that club president unable to refute. Duan continued, look at the reality. If everything goes smoothly, then you guys from the S club will have the earliest exotic pets of any club in the world, just like Abbas. Isn't this something worth considering? I'm very pleased to welcome you all here, with Jujin's confident and eloquent demeanor making everyone in the room impressed and supportive. Hanle praised him, saying that he is not only strong but also very skilled in negotiation. Furthermore, Duan's sweet words about his little brother being the club president and having a cute pet made me admire him more and more. If I had such a brother, I would have all these things too, wouldn't I? Do you want to join Breaker? Hun is persuasive words made someone who was not very happy standing behind immediately silent, waiting for the opportunity to leave this office. Dune quickly refused, saying, Ha ha, I already said I won't join any side. Wait until my little brother becomes the strongest in the country, then we'll talk. As soon as he finished speaking, the voice of the strongest in the country spoke up. Can Jupiter Club buy him? This guy is the president of the Jupiter Club, the strongest club in the country right now. This president is also very strong. If he supports Ju Jin, then Nguyen will surely be guaranteed. His words immediately made the atmosphere in the meeting room tense. Du Yin hurriedly found an excuse to ease the tension. He awkwardly smiled and replied, Only my little brother can be like that. The rest have to be world champions. Thanks to Du Yin's words, the tense atmosphere immediately disappeared, and everyone felt happy before Ju Jin's words. Indeed, if it weren't for the skill of resisting fear, you would probably have been crushed by the invisible pressure of these S-rank hunters. Duin secretly thought, S-rank hunters are always close to death, so they are not very normal. They smile on the surface, but the pressure they create for each other is terrible. Honey, how can you stand these monsters? A club president prays. It's great to have a brother like that. With just a piece of cloth, he could establish a club by himself but you seem to be more manageable than your brother. Duan smiled back, but his words defending his little brother were heavy as a thousand pounds. Do you have any opinion about my little brother? My little brother understands more than me. He even understands more than everyone here. Duan's words made the atmosphere somewhat tense again. Many club presidents looked surprised and doubtful, making Duan also surprised. Why? Did I say something wrong? Or something? He praised his little brother extravagantly, and everyone in the Hunter Association bowed their heads silently. Then they burst into laughter, very interested. Ha ha, he said Hun is easy to handle. I'm laughing to death. Someone save me. Even a dignified person like the Jupiter Club president couldn't help but try to hold back his laughter. Why am I laughing? It turns out that because there is a brother here, who is as generous as Ah, without any intention, he laughed like a child. I'm in pain, that crazy dog is acting charming in front of his big brother. Look at the attitudes of all the club presidents, except Duin. This god is very stubborn. TH saw his little brother being teased and immediately protected him. How dare you call Han the crazy dog? Aren't you insulting him just because he's still young? Thanks to the grand introduction of his little brother, everyone in the Hunter Association here laughed heartily. Duin, on the other hand, still didn't like the way they talked about his little brother. The contract agreement has been handed over, with many favorable terms for Jujin. Firstly, the five major clubs will ensure Jujin's safety. Not only that, but Jujin will also receive a new building named after him. The building will be located where the five major clubs can best protect. Han Doom will prioritize the missions of the five major clubs. The construction of the domestication facility will be funded by the four clubs, except for Abbas. Duan was truly, truly happy that he had to hold back from laughing loudly because of this success. Can't laugh too loudly. Soon to be the owner of a building, a huge building located in the center of Soon, a building named after me and protected by the five major clubs. Duan will prioritize the missions of the five major clubs. The construction of the domestication facility will be funded by the four clubs except for Abbas. Duan was truly, truly happy that he had to hold back from laughing loudly because of this success. Can't laugh too loudly. Soon to be the owner of a building, a huge building located in the center of Sim. The building will bear its name and be protected by the five great guilds to safeguard the illusion of Jin. Starting from now on, I will lead you there, Myung, and establish my equipment workshop. 
I should also convince Han to study there instead of going to the United States, and I will become famous, Jin, transitioning from a construction worker to a millionaire. At the age of 25, I will become a boss, just needing to collect rent without doing anything, still able to retire early. The final negotiations went smoothly. Both parties got their rights, and the contracts were signed. Both brothers were happy because the negotiation was successful under the protection of the five great guilds. Duwen will no longer worry about Nguyen and can focus on what needs to be done. Back at the dorm after a tense meeting, a table of delicious food was prepared, waiting for Jin. Jin told Bing Yu that we need to prepare early to leave the dorm. Before finishing, the knave Miam Yu misunderstood and thought he was being kicked out. Miam Yu cried and blamed himself, not giving Duan a chance to explain, even though Duan tried to stop him. Miam Yu insisted on leaving to avoid causing trouble, not wanting to lose someone skilled at making money for him. Duan, using his martial arts and acting skills, manipulated Jin's emotions. I don't think I can keep you by my side, Duan said. I feel guilty for making you suffer so much in life. After finding some valuable information, Duan became handsome and trustworthy in Miung Yu's eyes again. Miung Yu pretended to regret, but no matter how valuable the information was, Duan couldn't force him to stay. An inexplicable statement left Miung Yu curious. Rin then mentioned a training exercise that could help awaken someone with special skills. Borrowing a renowned character to manipulate psychological tactics to the extreme, the scene shifted to where Rin was alone in the research room absorbed in her work. She didn't notice a shadow outside the window as she returned to the dorm. After manipulating Miang Yu's psychology, Jin started training him. Dune told Miang Yu that he could assist with weapons, so he should sharpen these knives first. Sure enough, as soon as Miang Yu sharpened them, his skills were activated. The counter began jumping to increase credibility. Jin informed Miang Yu that by maintaining this sharpening, he would gain skills related to weapons. These are legendary skills that could support him for life. Miyun Yu found it unbelievable, but he only needed to sharpen them to 10,000 points, which seemed achievable. He could finish it in just 100 days. Persistence was something he didn't lack. Duan was stunned by Miyun Yu's determination. Are you planning not to eat or sleep while sharpening those knives? Duan asked. Seeing Miyun Yu's determined expression made Duan very pleased. His retirement fund number one seemed to be settling, so he moved on to his second fund, which was none other than the beautiful Anne. With small shares of knowledge about his dungeon, Jid made Anne very interested in these extremely new and useful pieces of information. Anne's research was at a standstill because South Korea, being a small country, didn't have many dungeons to study. Also, larger countries didn't allow outsiders to study their dungeons. That was why Anne decided to join a research organization in the United States in the future. Three years later, her research concluded on the rules of dungeon initiation, and the United States was granted a huge copyright fee for that research, ensuring Jin's retirement fund. Suddenly, Anne brought out a ditch called Muk, the favorite food of a creature named Dukabi, the name given to demon hunters who were not dependent or bound by anyone or any guild. It is rumored that the Dukabi are extremely peculiar creatures whose names and genders remain unknown to this day. The only thing known about them is their ability for instant teleportation. This ability allows them to move anywhere they desire. The Dukabi are renowned for saving many lives during dungeon explosions and natural disasters, thanks to this teleportation ability. Underground organizations fear the Dukabi because once their illegal activities are exposed, they have the power to hold them accountable. The Dukabi always appear unexpectedly and even if the authorities try to apprehend them, they cannot be caught before they vanish. They always leave behind a message. We know all the secrets, but as long as we are safe, they will never be revealed. Therefore, the Dukabi are always free to move without any constraints, and suspects that they know many secrets about the dungeon, so they likely go online to learn how to cook to lure others. Both of them were talking when suddenly the power went out. As you might know when there's a power outage, ghosts tend to appear. Duan turned on his phone's flashlight and saw Hayen standing frozen with a terrified expression behind Ju Jin. There was indeed a terrifying ghost appearing, and Hayen was so frightened that she screamed and fell unconscious. Initially startled, Duan quickly regained composure thanks to his resistance to fear and immediately thought of the legendary entity. He loudly exclaimed, 
Enough of this nonsense. Come out, Gobby, and drop that scary act. The terrifying figure vanished, replaced by a peculiarly dressed ancient-looking person who removed his ghostly mask. Underneath was another mask, colored red, covering half of his face. I'm here because she wanted to see me, Duin said, using his observational skills to discern that this person could also be influenced. Standing before Duin was a freelance hunter who didn't belong in any organization, someone who enjoyed doing whatever pleased them, even embodying mythical characters. Duin calculated that if he could enlist this person's help, Hey Ed wouldn't need to go to America. Looking straight into Director Kai's eyes, Duin confidently stated, I'm not afraid of your tricks, you know. Why don't you just knock me out? Director C. Bai chuckled arrogantly, thinking Duin was scared, but Duin countered, making him angrily retort. Ju Jin seized this opportunity to assert his dominance over Director C. Bai, who was rumored to enjoy pranks and threats. Ju Jin challenged him to a bet. If Director C. Bai scared Duin, he would win, and vice versa. The loser would serve the winner for a specified time. Director C. Bai found the rules simple but suspicious. He signed the contract despite knowing he would lose, sensing something sinister about Duin. He thought Duin was just a weak bully or perhaps had some items. Unaware of Duin's special skill in resisting fear, which he had activated the moment Director C. Bai accepted the challenge. To enhance his credibility and reduce suspicion, Duin pretended to reluctantly admit, Well, I do have a motive, to be honest. Flattering him, he continued, You're so cool, holding so many secrets and saving hundreds of people. Super cool indeed. So, what's there for me to lose? I only have a chance to win. Who knows, luck might be on my side. And even if I lose, becoming your subordinate for a while is still cool, just a part of the effort. With his persuasive words, Duin successfully manipulated Director C. Bai, who was now completely under his influence, jubilantly accepting the agreement. Director C. Bai agreed to three bets per week, feeling pleased with himself. From now on, if you're threatened but not scared, I'll become your subordinate again. Back in Heian's room, Duin stated that he would assist her in gathering information, but couldn't reveal how he would obtain that information. However, Duin affirmed that he would provide enough resources for her to carry out her research. When Heian succeeded, she just needed to share the profits with him. Seeing Duin's enthusiasm, Heian hesitated, fearing that her research might not succeed. Duin immediately cheered her up. Don't think like that. I'm sure you'll succeed. You're amazing. Heian. He then playfully touched his head as if performing a martial arts move, reminiscing about the past. Then he revealed some shocking information that he recently discovered. There's been a newly discovered class of prison recently found in Inchon province, under the jurisdiction of the Environmental Protection Bureau. That prison could be located in a damp area or near the coast. Hayen widened her eyes in astonishment and hurriedly asked, How did you find out? How could you know? Well, because I'm from the future, Duan replied nonchalantly not answering Hayan's question, but instead standing up and reiterating his proposal. I'm confident you'll do it. So don't worry too much about the research outcome. Just think it over. And remember to convey the message to your uncle. Take back the power about managing that prison and start planning for the second stage of the retirement fund. Consider it as already done. The task Jujin needs to do now is to play with the director cab for a week that night in the hostel room where the first bullying threat began. C. Bai disguised himself as an elderly human ghost suddenly appeared by the window, but now, Ju Jin remained calm and played with piss as if nothing had happened. The first effort of Director Cab failed miserably. The next day, Ju Jin returned home with a box of alcohol knives to continue sharpening. As he entered the house, demonic hands reached out from nowhere, grabbing his legs, causing Ju Jin to fall flat on his face. This time, not only did it not scare Ju Jin, but he also scolded and slapped because of the offense of touching the weak body of the oppressed. The second effort also failed. That night, it was raining heavily outside, signaling something terrible was about to happen. Jujin woke up thirsty in the middle of the night, yawning, opening the refrigerator, and a straw figure covered in fresh blood fell from the ceiling. Of course, Jujin was not afraid at all. This straw figure, ha ha, you really used up your three times, but there was no response. Suddenly, Ju Jin heard a noise behind him, which attracted him to turn back, and there was a terrifying demon with red eyes like blood on the ceiling. 
reaching out with sharp claws to grab Ji Jin. This threat was truly terrifying. But if Ji Jin didn't have the ability to resist fear, he would probably have to change a few diapers. This didn't end. Another threat came from behind Ju Jin, a figure with long hair walking towards him with a sharp knife behind his back. Slowly turning back, it was Miao Yu in a terrifying state. Looking at him now, he was no different from a serial killer, but Ju Jin remained calm as if the person threatening others was not scared to death, suddenly shouting, Oh, there's a ghost. It turned out to be Mian Yu couldn't sleep, so he went to sharpen a few more knives and unexpectedly threatened the one who specialized in threatening others to death. Mian Yu, seeing the terrifying figure in the corner, also fell to the ground, foaming at the mouth unconscious. Director Cab's third attempt failed, and he officially surrendered, crying like a child without milk, whimpering, Oh, I lost. Why did I rush into signing the contract? However, I will be roasted alive if I return to them. I can't go back. I won't go back. I want to stay here forever. Jujin, tired of this, said, Okay, stop crying. Don't cry anymore. How old are you? Director Cab, cried and answering. I'm just over 100 years old. Jujin still didn't believe it and replied, Don't joke with me. You must be just acting. How can a Director Cab exist? But after a few minutes of hesitation, Jujin also felt that Director Cab's existence was more believable than the dungeon. With his fake awakening, he used his observation ability to realize that this mysterious figure in front of him was indeed not a fake Director Cab. At this moment, he recounted his background and appearance to Jujin, who was over 100 years old and still acted like a child. Five years later, Jujin suddenly realized that this person appeared at the same time as the original system of Director Kabi, initially entities born from the souls residing in old objects when the dungeon was born. The power of the dungeon gradually seeped into and awakened him, a person who had been asleep for over 100 years. Jujin secretly thought that it made sense. If so, his ability to shift would be more plausible because the power of the system was something that could connect this space with another space. But really, I didn't expect Director Cab's existence to be real. In general, the bet has won. Now Jujin has a person with extraordinary abilities in his hands, which helps him gather information easier than ever. Jujin picked up his tablet and said, I have a job for you, Director K. But looking at this resentful expression, it seems that he doesn't want to do it anymore. Director Cab, again, feigned reluctance, showing no desire to do it anymore. Jujin displayed his acting skills again. Oh, if you do it, you will become a great hero. Jujin poured out a bunch of winged words like the investigation would be to save the world, and then the information collector would become famous and the hero of the world. Oh, just thinking about it makes me happy. Have you heard the cheers of the people every time you appear? No, then you will be the symbol of millions of famous brands. His words touched Director Cab's heart, making him so happy that he didn't whine anymore but laughed happily, accepting the mission to save the world. But carefully observing, it became clear that he couldn't travel too far into other countries like that. Yuan had no other choice but to use his influencing skills to help enhance his abilities. Looking at Doc Kai with a face like he had lost his mind, Yuan blurted out, Doc Kai, I love you, in a voice that surprised Doc Kai. It made Doc Kai startle a bit, then collapse in horror. What on earth? Yuan hurriedly explained, embarrassed. You didn't know. Doc Kai is known to have a lot of emotions. Some even say he is turned into a beautiful woman to deceive people. A true Doc Kai must be familiar with love and affection. Yuan's tongue and cheek ability and charming skills had indeed persuaded Doc Kai gradually. Yuan continued in a soft voice. From now on, let's greet each other like this, okay? I love you, Yun Yun. Now it was Doc Kai's turn. Doc Kai was still overwhelmed with the sudden display of affection, but my voice was so twisted that it made him feel awkward, and he slipped away with just his talent for blabbering and acting top-notch. Yuan had turned someone with special abilities into an indispensable subordinate. The next day, the two grandsons of the Seal family didn't know what had happened but excitedly pushed open the door. They entered the room happily, dancing in front of Yuan. This is right, Yuan, one of them said. Absolutely correct. Oh, so they are celebrating because they discovered the dungeon that Yuan revealed, and thought, due to being the first to capture it, 
The Abbas Guild had harvested a considerable amount of wealth in the eyes of Sim Zong. Yuan was becoming a treasure rather than a troublesome guild leader, and also accepted the proposal to support Sim Dun's research. He suggested attaching a tracking device to Yuan so that he could be protected at all times. Of course, doing so was no different from confinement, so Yuan didn't agree. He only requested that he help Anne as much as possible to complete the research he and Sim Dung were collaborating on. That said, Yuan quickly ran away with piss, avoiding Yuan's ridiculous actions that impressed the two grandsons even more. Oh, he is indeed a true researcher, someone who only cares about helping with the upcoming research rather than contributing to himself, and thought. Although Yuan didn't show it, it was evident that he cared more about the guild than anyone else. Misunderstandings seemed to be growing day by day. Yuan kept refusing, but it seemed that the effect was working the other way around. The next day, they encountered a pet maze. Even intelligent animals like dogs and cats took a few minutes to get out. Let's wait and see how long it will take for the fire mage. It was too fast, too dangerous, and there was no time to explain. P had already left the maze. Indeed, advanced demon beasts were extremely intelligent. P returned to Wise Embrace, receiving warm praises and applause. It turned out that the owner was participating in a TV game show. Speaking of which, going on TV required going back in time a bit. Sim Dung went to see Yuan with a radiant face. Then he handed him an invitation to participate in the game show. He wanted Yuan to go on TV to promote himself so that everyone would know a monster trainer like him. Even if everything was hidden, it would eventually spread. So why not let people know sooner rather than later? The more people know, the safer it is, and maybe more people will aim for it. Being on TV made Yuan feel uncomfortable because in his past life, he had unpleasant memories with crowds. If Yuan failed or didn't meet the expectations of some people, he might have to endure those horrible curses again. But anyway, Yuan's TV appearance was very successful. This adorable and cheesy style captured the hearts of even the most demanding audience. Acting was his profession, and from today onwards, Yuan's fame would surely soar. Yuan reclined on a comfortable chair with a satisfied face, happy that he had perfected his pet perfectly. And of course, every time this happened, the daydreams of this general would come to mind again, becoming famous, surrounded by many beautiful girls. Should he create a social media account and then sell albums and various merchandise, then Peace would become a global star when he grew up, and he would be the owner. He would be so rich that thousands of people would line up for autographs. Lost in his thoughts, he heard a sweet voice saying, I'll be the first one to ask for your autograph. Both owners were startled. When they opened their eyes, they saw a beautiful girl, but as big as a guild leader. It turned out she wanted to record high-level demon beasts, so she needed at least three great hunters. That's why she was here today, and partly because she also wanted to meet Yuan. The appearance of this talented, beautiful, and tall girl immediately attracted many admiring glances. Mun, wanting to help Yu Jin up, reached out her hand. However, her demeanor made Yu Jin hesitate to accept the gesture. Despite Hana's friendly gestures, Yu Jin was afraid of being misunderstood by others. Nonetheless, Hana seemed oblivious to Yu Jin's discomfort and continued to insist. Suddenly, she dropped a shocking statement that startled everyone around. Why bother caring? She said. After all, you'll be the one raising my child. Yu Jin was taken aback by her audacity. Hana persisted in her advances, expressing her genuine liking towards Yu Jin. Would you like to come to my party? She asked. Yu Jin responded bluntly. Why should I comply with your request? Her fearless tone didn't seem to phase Hane, which only intrigued Mun further. Hana grabbed Yu Jin's shoulder and made a move that startled Piss, indicating her intent. Meanwhile, Aram returned with drinks, looking concerned as she observed the situation. Mana seemed to be creating a barrier, isolating themselves from outsiders, but their demeanor didn't appear threatening. However, Yu Jin didn't appreciate this behavior. She explained that the barrier was primarily for soundproofing, suggesting that there might be something she wanted to discuss privately with Yu Jin. Although they were both part of Class S, Yu Jin perceived Mana as inferior. Nevertheless, she resigned herself to the situation, opting to go along with it. With a forced smile, she asked Mun a what secret she intended to reveal. Han and his revelation was about Yu Han, Yu Jin's younger brother. Mun's sudden seriousness caught Yu Jin off guard. 
she urged Yu Jin to learn more about her brother, hinting at something significant. Yu Jin was astonished but agreed to delve deeper into the matter. During negotiations, I laughed incredulously, but Mane emphasized the importance of trust in their relationship. She hinted that Yu Jin's seemingly innocent brother had a darker side. Yu Jin was about to defend her brother when Mane interrupted, asserting that he might seem like an angel, but even angels have their motives. Mana questioned whether it was wise to divulge the truth about Yu Jin's brother, who, as a hunter, had experienced more than Yu Jin realized. Despite Yu Jin's initial skepticism, she listened intently as Mana recounted the day they first encountered Yu Van. It was at a lavish party hosted by wealthy conglomerates. Yu Jin, a representative of Sea World, was there to secure sponsorships. The altercation began when Yu Han confronted a wealthy individual who belittled him, claiming he should be grateful for their sponsorship offer. Yu Han, then just a high school student trying to build his own guild, brushed off their condescension. To everyone's surprise, rumors surfaced that someone had plotted to kill him, yet he remained unfazed. Mana decided to intervene, but what they discovered was beyond their imagination. Inside, they found a scene reminiscent of hell, with chaired corpses strewn about. Han Yu Han stood, sword in hand, facing the man who had provoked him at the party. Despite the man's pleas, Yu Han remained cold and merciless, revealing that a massacre had occurred earlier that day. The perpetrator, a teenager without even proper identification, Yu Han didn't hesitate to attack Mun as well, revealing a dark, bloodthirsty side hidden beneath his scholarly facade. The incident was subsequently covered up, citing a gas explosion as the final blow to the Abyss Guild's power. Abyss gradually asserted dominance, forcing opposition to kneel before them. Yu Jin found this hard to believe, but Han He asserted that a Class S pretender would resort to such measures. She had no reason to fabricate the story. Placing her hand on Yu Jin's shoulder, Han He continued, At least the face I see from him is different from the brother you once knew. He's a monster pretending to be a kind brother. You'll never know when you'll show his true face to you. Don't get too close. While talking ill of him, someone is calling from a number saved as wretched lunatic in her contacts. This is the name she specifically reserved for Yu Han. Holding the phone, Hana hesitated before turning to Yu Jin, asking, What's up with your brother? If you want to maintain distance from him, let me handle it. After a moment of contemplation, Yu Jin spoke up. I understand. So, she's been through this mess too. Without saying another word, Yu Jin snatched the phone from Hana's hand and answered the call. Immediately, furious curses erupted from the other end. Damn that woman, muttered Yu Jin's brother in English, hastily asking if everything was okay and if the woman had said anything strange to him. Yu Jin understands her younger brother. He also understands how cruel this awakened world can be no matter how Yu Han may become. In Yu Jin's eyes, he remains the beloved younger brother whom he cherishes the most. When Yu Jin's younger brother asks a question, Yu Jin doesn't hesitate to respond. Yes, she's talking trash about you. Yu Jin says bluntly, Han can only sigh with frustration and annoyance. He has been in the future, he has lived through difficult days, and he has survived by stepping on others' livelihoods. He has also witnessed how his younger brother sacrificed his life to save him. To outsiders, it may not mean much, but to Yu Jin, Yu Jin is always the person whom Yu Han can sacrifice anything to protect. Seemingly belittled by others, Yu Han says bad things about her behind her back, so he will do the same behind hers. Isn't it better to speak behind the back? About a year ago, specifically in April of last year, Yu Han recalls the moment he was jerked into the future. Four years ahead, his dark past will be exposed before the whole country. Han knows it so he intends to speak ill. But before he could, she quickly snatched the iPhone 14 Pro Max from him and then crushed it, both angrily and shamefully. Han turns to Yu Jin and interrogates. How did you know? Where did you hear that? Yu Jin retorts. Speak quickly, damn it. I wish I could kill you to shut your mouth. In reality, Yu Jin only wants to use this secret of hers as an insurance policy, ensuring she won't expose her younger brother's secrets. Reluctantly, Hung has no choice but to accept the compromise. Both of them will keep each other's secrets. Despite not wanting to, Hun has achieved his purpose of probing her. He's not worried about other leaders threatening Yu Jin to join their faction anymore. He casually brushes it off. Externally calm, 
You in size internally, the world of these Class S individuals is truly complicated and troublesome. As the tension dissipates, Arun rushes in to protect. Outwardly, they seem at odds, but Yu Jin is surprised by how close they become, perhaps because they are the only two S-Class hunters. The sad truth is that the Breakers Guild will soon disband due to Mun's boredom. In this small country, everything is like that. So in the future, both the MKC and Breaker Guilds will disband. Yuin ponders whether she should recruit her and her team. The system wants him to influence more S-Class individuals. If Han and his team are suitable for Arim because she has formidable attack skills. Returning home, Yu Jin sits, feeling weary of the television program he participated in. Instead of being called the pure monster hunter, Yu Jin now has a very endearing title imprinted on the minds of the people, the father of the monster Han. Yuin continues to nurture Mian Yu. She can't let him just sit in the kitchen. Thanks to her influence, Mian Yu has been granted a position in the equipment maintenance department of the guild. He truly wants to do what he loves. He doesn't want to fight or venture into dangerous dungeons with an unimpressive physique. Yuin understands this well. Later, Mian Yu will become a top-tier blacksmith, not just a hunter. As they approach the maintenance equipment room, the heat and smoke hit them. Inside is a giant weapons production workshop, also responsible for producing weapons and tools for the guild. Its grandeur surprises both of them. They eagerly explore, and Mian Yu is drawn to a magic stone. As Din reaches out to touch it, a middle-aged, burly man appears out of nowhere, booming. Don't touch it. This is the manager of this place. Yuin explains that he brought them here to work. As per the prior arrangement, he takes them inside a room full of discarded items, resembling a junkyard. He points to a conventional grinding machine in front of Myung Yoon and says it's his usual tool. With that, he turns and leaves. Yuin feels a bit uncomfortable and calls him back. Wait, that was a bit rude of you to lead two people in this narrow, dark room like this. Aren't you afraid they'll cause trouble? Mion quickly intervenes as Yujin finally notices the unfriendly looks from outsiders. Along with that are derogatory remarks and unpleasant hearing about that guy, who is your brother's friend, head of the association. Ha! Huh. Heard he's the type to pressure others while not even being able to handle pressure himself. It's true, he relies on his authority. Damn it, we're already busy, and he's still demanding. You don't want Yujin to be in a difficult situation. You're aware that your level always has to endure those cold glars. So leaving and using the equipment is already good for me. I'll work diligently. Mian Yu chuckled inwardly. He must be feeling really sad. Seeing Mian Yu's natural demeanor made Yuin feel guilty for bringing him here. Ignoring the banter, Mian Yu began his favorite work. Although it's an old grinder, fortunately, it still works. Mian Yu started testing the first knife. The clashing sounds between metal and grinding stone showed it worked really well. In just a moment, the rusty knife became shiny and sharp. The current speed is 72 one hundredths, still a long way to go to reach this milestone. The machine is fine. Mion Yu tied back his long hair, preparing to focus on work. Seeing Mion Yu diligently working made Yuin slightly worried and reminded. But it seems Mion Yu didn't hear anything. Yuin was truly surprised to see Mian Yu focused on work. This serious and handsome expression, the calmness and confidence emitted when he worked, it's really different from his usual weak self. In Mian Yu's eyes at this moment, besides the knives and the grinder, there seems to be nothing else. The timer rang. Goodbye, Mian Yu, I'll go back to training PCEE now. This time, Yuin truly saw a different side of Mian Yu. It made Yuin want to observe him more. If he didn't have work, Yuin left with mixed feelings. Awakening, he wondered if a cramped fish struggling to survive in muddy water would have such an arrogant appearance when returning to the vast ocean. Just by looking at his demeanor now, even someone as insensitive as him could recognize his innate talent. Watching Mian Yu earnestly focused on work, Yuin left feeling relieved, but the next day Mian Yu couldn't get out of bed. His whole body was damp, and he had muscle injuries. Not knowing how much he got done to be so seriously injured, at the production workshop, people had the opportunity to gossip about Mian Yu, who had only worked for a day and had to rest due to unbearable suffering. But things seemed not as they thought. Uncle pushed open the warehouse door and called them to see with a serious tone. Come over here for a moment. Do you think a lazy person can do this? 1000. 
That's 1,000 sharp knives perfectly sharpened by Myung Yu just in one day, a tremendous amount. A person with a rudimentary grinder can sharpen 1,000 sharp knives just in one first day of work. It's unbelievable. About a week later, the number of knives sharpened by Myung Yu had reached a staggering number. Everyone here no longer looked down on him. Instead, they were surprised and admired Myung Yu still focused on his favorite work without caring about the world around him. Every knife he sharpened perfectly. The quantity of knives Myung Yu made reached 5,600. Not only talented in forging, Myung Yu also cooked very deliciously. The dishes under his hands shone, making Yu and Iram unable to take their eyes off. Iram changed her attitude towards Myung Yu completely. She no longer acted aloof, but became gentle. Hey, Myung Yu, let's live together forever, she said. The most boring way to intimacy is only through the mouth and stomach. Let's just eat and enjoy it, Iram said during the meal, saying she felt bored because she was still small and only allowed to eat a few dungeon rations. Iram planned to raid more dungeons to quickly level up, but Yuan said no, it's very dangerous. Physical strength may be realized when weakened, but mana is very difficult. It will be very dangerous if lacking mana while raiding dungeons. Yuan asked about Iram's current mana amount. She said it's 102, which made Yuan fall into depression. Yuan's mana is only 2 points plus 29 points from equipment. She is 51 times higher than Yuan. Now, Yuan noticed Ming Yu's hands which were covered in scratches and calluses after just one week of sharpening 5,600 knives. Eugene expressed concern, advising Mayam not to overwork himself, but Mayam just smiled back, saying there was no issue. He worked hard because it was a job he loved. To protect Mayam's hands, Eugene gave him a pair of gloves, an A-grade item, which received genuine appreciation from Miam. In the following days, Mayam continued to work passionately and diligently. His efforts changed the perception of those around him. They no longer looked down on Miam but showed him respect and care. Besides Yu Jin, Miam began to receive attention from others, which surprised and touched him, making his work smoother day by day. Miam became so engrossed in his work that he lost track of time. When he finally checked the time, it was late, and everyone else had already left the workshop, leaving him alone. It was then that Miam remembered the magic stone displayed on the pedestal. Approaching it, he heard a booming voice cautioning him not to touch it. It was the workshop supervisor who had not yet left. He explained to Mayim that it was a grade S magic stone, extremely rare and difficult to refine. This was something beyond Mayim's current qualifications to even dream of. The supervisor was straightforward, acknowledging Mayim's struggles due to his employment through connections, but emphasized the importance of skills. He assured Mayam that occasional opportunities were granted to those deserving, and Mayam had proven himself through hard work and perseverance. Despite the supervisor's straightforwardness, Mayam was overjoyed. Finally, besides Eugene, others no longer looked down on him. However, an unexpected event occurred the next day while Mayam was at work. Two individuals, a man and a woman, arrived with solemn expressions, requesting Mayam's cooperation in investigating a shocking matter. Han Yu Jin had disappeared. This news deeply worried Mayam, who continuously inquired, affirming that Yu Jin was always in the training facility, with Peace. Just then, Yim, also known as Peace, emerged, asking what was happening. He had abandoned the raid dungeon mission upon hearing about Yu Jin's predicament. However, there was no news yet on what had happened or why Yu Jin disappeared. Several hours before Yu Jin went missing, inside the Abyss building, Eugene was lounging on a sofa while his pet, Piss, wreaked havoc around the house. Without Abbas' support, Eugene's career and home would be in shambles. Feeling bored, Eugene decided to go to the training room, ensuring his safety was paramount. Thus, members of the five great guilds took turns guarding him. Today, it was MKC's turn. While observing, Eugene noticed that MKC seemed like a fake awakening, although his behavior was slightly odd. Guards usually enjoyed Piss's antics, but MKC paid them no mind. When the elevator stopped on a floor, three individuals entered, pushing two large suitcases. Upon inquiry, they revealed they were from the Brick Guild, below Abyss, and the suitcases contained items collected from the dungeon. They politely asked to use the training room for inspection. Despite their friendly demeanor, Eugene sensed something amiss, especially since they didn't praise the piece's abilities. 
As Yu Jin released piss, two of the three individuals who had been behind suddenly approached with ropes and a bottle of liquid. Yu Jin realized it too late. They had splashed the liquid towards him. Due to his poison resistant skill, he was unaffected, but piss was not as lucky. It must have been a sedative. Piss collapsed immediately upon contact with the red liquid, completely unconscious. Before Yu Jin could react, the blonde haired individual approached, swiftly covering his mouth with a cloth soaked in a mid grade sedative. However, it had little effect on Yu Jin. Seizing a moment of vulnerability, Yu Jin countered, aiming to escape. He swiftly kicked the person standing in front of him straight in the chest, then forcefully pulled away from the blonde haired person's grip behind him. Yu Jin dashed outside, intending to seek help from the guards. However, to his surprise, the guard turned out to be one of the attackers who had given him a punch in the stomach that sent him crumbling to the ground. It turned out this guard was also part of the kidnapping gang, well informed about Yu Jin's stat enhancing items. He instructed his accomplices to remove those items from Yu Jin, leaving him defenseless. As his equipment was gradually stripped away, Yu Jin lost the ability to resist. Even the plus 29 mana earring he had used extensively was taken, reducing his mana from 29 to just 10 points, far from enough to maintain his energy. Yu Jin immediately fell into a state of unconsciousness. When Yu Jin regained consciousness after being splashed with water, he found himself in a strange place. Sitting in front of him was a scar-faced man who looked very fierce. This man was also a fake awakening expert, B-Class. He didn't beat around the bush and grabbed Yu Jin's hair straight to the point. Are you holding the master's code? He asked, sternly. No, Yu Jin replied. Give it to me then, the man demanded. I think you should give up hope slowly. This place is a secret. No one can find you. He continued, his words indicating that peace was still intact. It seems like they also brought peace here. Yu Jin spoke up with a hint of authority. Judging by your relaxed demeanor, you must have planned your escape beforehand. In his hand, the man held Yu Jin's phone, showing him that no one had noticed Yu Jin's abduction. If anyone did, it would be difficult to find where he was being held captive because this was a port with thousands of containers. Even if they managed to find him, it would take a long time. They were planning to take Yu Jin and Pak onto a ship bound for Japan. He planned to take Yu Jin's master over there to auction him off, which made Yu Jin somewhat anxious. If they didn't find him in time before the ship reached international waters, things would become much more complicated. What C needed to do now was to figure out how to prolong the time. Yu Jin smirked at him. You think I'm stupid? What makes you think I'd hand over the master's code? After hearing those words, you just admitted I'm valuable. So now I know you can't touch me. Why should I be afraid? Then, he proceeded to taunt and insult the man, making him furious. And of course, Yu Jin had to endure a few blows from him, mercilessly. However, he didn't show an ounce of fear, which only made the man more irritated. Though he couldn't kill Yu Jin, torturing him was definitely within his options. Yu Jin intentionally provoked him to the point where he had to be hospitalized. Yet instead of that, the man grabbed Yu Jin by the neck and dragged him to another container. With a forceful throw, Yu Jin's body slammed against the iron bars behind. It seemed like this place was holding some kind of dangerous monster. Behind the bars, there was a shovel poking out, indicating its presence. It was a grade C monster named Kree, capable of inflicting excruciating pain with its venomous shovel. Seeing Yu Jin's fearful expression, the man was satisfied. He closed the door slowly, leaving him inside. However, he didn't know that this would be the biggest mistake of his life. The scene shifted back to ABS headquarters, where Yim was genuinely worried. She and two investigators were meeting Hun, who, upon encountering Yim, didn't say a word. He approached her slowly, grabbing her collar firmly and apologizing, citing the strict security within ABS. However, he mentioned that Mr. N. Dai's authority was absolute. Looking at what had happened, Hun calmly explained the situation, which seemed somewhat unreasonable. There was very little possibility that a direct subordinate of the level S hunter had betrayed them. It seemed that the bodyguard wasn't originally assigned to protect someone within MKC. Someone within MKC had interfered with ABS's operations. MKC said a society sponsored by unconscious power wielders was different from ABS, which centered its power around hunters. Hun speculated that someone among the sponsors of MKC had investigated and acted against Yin. 
However, they never expected that they would collude with a subsidiary organization of ABIs to carry out this action. These subsidiaries were merely low-level hunters, so they went unnoticed. At present, they couldn't determine Yin's whereabouts. That's why they called Yim. They wanted her to use her clairvoyance skill to examine Yim's memories. Yim also noticed the smell of blood in the room. After opening the door next to her, she found the dead body of an MKC bodyguard. Hon hoped that Yim's skill could find out from this bodyguard's memories where Yu Jin was being held captive. Meanwhile, the kidnapper holding Yu Jin's phone wondered why there were no messages reporting back. Unbeknownst to him, the bodyguard he was in cahoots with had already sold him out. Their holding location was about to be discovered. Nonetheless, all he needed was to obtain the master's code, and he didn't care about anything else. Returning to the container where Yu Jin was being kept, he was intrigued by the sight of Yu Jin lying motionless. As he approached, he kicked Yu Jin with great satisfaction, thinking that his torture had worked. Yet, to his surprise, the grade C monster, Kree, had broken free from its confinement. Hearing Yu Jin's call, it lunged forward with its shovel, catching the kidnapper off guard. Despite being a B-class fake awakening expert, he couldn't react in time and was taken aback when the monster's shovel caught him. He couldn't believe his eyes anymore. He didn't know how Yu Jin could have subdued a fully grown level C monster. Now, the situation had turned against him. His decision to confine Yu Jin here was his mistake, and he would pay for underestimating an awakened level C pseudo beast controlled by Branky. Losing a hand to the kidnapper had proved extremely uncomfortable. It was quite different from what he had heard about Yu Jin. He never expected Yu Jin could do something like this. Yu Jin looked at him with determination. You don't believe a level C pseudo beast could do this, right? Actually, I can do more than you think. He recalled the moment when he stood before a blinded level C monster. He had almost no resistance left and thought he would die for sure this time. Even with his resistance to poison and curses due to his skills, a direct bite would have meant certain death. Of course, he couldn't just sit and wait to die. Though blinded, he could still use his tools. Yu Jin took out a small knife and cut the blindfold for himself. However, facing a level C monster was overwhelming for a weak pseudo-beast hunter like him. But something unexpected happened. For some reason, the monster didn't attack but instead retreated, showing signs of fear. It was because La Cheetah's enemy detection skill had activated, doubling all skills when facing CJY-type monsters. Since it affected dragon species using curses and toxins, and CZ was also a dragon species, it was genuinely threatened by the high-level dragon. It looked at Yu Jin with horror, trembling all over. Yu Jin thought that the doubling effect also applied to skills affecting him. He discarded the knife to show goodwill, wanting to befriend it. He took out a level C magic stone from his pouch and fed it to the monster. That was how he managed to tame it within three minutes. This time, Yu Jin was truly fortunate. However, in front of him was still a level B hunter and this dragon monster only belonged to level C and F. There was still a considerable obstacle to overcome. As it lunged to bite him, Blackie, as Yu Jin named it, received a command. The dragon rushed forward, snapping its teeth, grabbing the kidnapper's arm. The level B hunter was not an easy target. He swung his arm forcefully, breaking the teeth into pieces. Though he'd escaped, his arm had been poisoned. Before he could regain his composure, Eugene approached from behind and stabbed deep into his arm with a dagger. Even with a disabled arm, Eugene would have the advantage. However, due to Eugene's weakened condition from the poison, he couldn't inflict significant injuries. The hunter swung his arm violently, pushing Eugene away. Eugene continued his assault. Even a small knife had an effect on a weakened level B hunter due to poisoning and injuries. Humiliating him, he clung to his injured arm, gnashing his teeth in pain, not giving him time to breathe. Continuing to command Blackie to attack the kidnapper, Yu Jin thought, even though he was a level B hunter, he wouldn't just stand still and wait to die. Summoning his remaining arm, he summoned his weapon with determination. He was indeed a level B hunter. Despite being weakened by poison and losing a hand, the level C monster was still too easy to be slain with one decisive blow. As he turned to look at Yu Jin with murderous eyes, he thought that only he could do anything, but he didn't know the nightmare was just beginning. Yu Jin remained silent, sitting down, placing his hand on Breaky's body. As the kidnapper sought revenge, he suddenly felt his body weaken, 
and the poison began to spread. He collapsed, almost devoid of strength. He cried out, What's happening? I've killed it, and its curse was even lower than my level. Why? He looked up, and Yu Jin had transformed. Yu Jin's eyes were now yellow, like Breaky's. Not only that, but there were also Breaky's fangs behind him. It was because the skill of La Cheetah's enemy detection had finally been activated. It had helped him survive until now. All of Breaky's skills and stats had been transferred to Yu Jin with twice the efficiency. Additionally, the activation of La Cheetah's enemy skill had increased the emotional impact effect twice, resulting in a fourfold increase in skill effects. Thus, it was understandable that a level B hunter couldn't withstand it. He writhed in agony, lying on the ground with his body poisoned to the extreme. At present, besides waiting for death, he could do nothing else. Yu Jin looked at him with icy eyes. Why did you want to disturb someone who just wanted to live peacefully? Yu Jin grabbed the kidnapper's head. Answer me now, where is P? But the kidnapper, being stubborn, not only remained silent but also uttered insults. The dog who gave birth to you. What kind of monster is he? You miserable creature. I will kill you, remember my words. His words only made Yu Jin feel even more icy. He looked at him, expressionless. It seemed like he wouldn't speak. So, I think there's no reason to spare you anymore. Yu Jin uttered, activating his deadly skill. From his hand, a stream of dark, sinister water slowly flowed, corroding his opponent's defensive aura. Yu Jin took the life of the hunter B rank without revealing any emotion. Sorry, but my skills are not allowed to be disclosed of others, he stated. Yu Jin didn't think he would ever take a life, but now regretted not leaving his opponent's body intact because they had a girl who could rid the thoughts of the dead through empathetic skills. Thanks to this last skill, Yu Jin was now truly powerful. He couldn't control the sudden surge in power. This skill used to last only an hour, but now it had extended to a week. Stopping briefly to check Breaky's skills, Yu Jin discovered a highly useful one, a D-rank skill. It allowed the user to blend with the surroundings to conceal their presence, essentially turning invisible. Another skill was the intuition of the weak, helping the user detect stronger foes. With these two skills, Yu Jin could confidently seek out Pit without fearing encountering someone stronger. Yu Jin activated his body's automatic transformation to blend with the colors and environment around him. In the rooms where the kidnappers were still chatting, they were unaware of the impending danger due to Yu Jin's invisibility. He easily subdued them with his skillful techniques until they were all unconscious, not understanding what had happened. Entering the last room, Yu Jin kicked the door open. Inside, there was a guy sitting casually, engrossed in playing a game on his phone. Seeing Yu Jin standing at the door, he startled, dropping his phone. He turned and asked how Yu Jin managed to escape. Yu Jin didn't bother with nonsense, asking straight, Where's the fire mage? My horn? But he didn't say anything. Holding a metal box nearby, he threw it past Yu Jin. With a sneer, Yu Jin said, You're lucky to escape from me. You should have fled instead of coming to me. Drawing his weapon, the guy acted tough, saying he was holding the key to the mage's cell. Why didn't you come here and take it from the B-rank hunter instead of me, a mere D-rank hunter? Before he could finish his sentence, a sudden blow from an invisible state twisted his mouth, leaving him puzzled as to why he was being punched. Yu Jin, coldly, handed over the key and revealed where Pit was. The guy hesitated but then agreed. Fine, I'll take you to the cell in the first ship, but I have a condition. You have to sign a contract before I hand it over. I need to ensure my safety through the contract you sign here. Don't attack me afterwards. Yu Jin added the condition that he couldn't disclose anything about Yu Jin. Without hesitation, the guy signed, thinking everything was settled. But suddenly, his eyes gleamed with malice. He transformed his hand into a demon's hand and lunged at Yu Jin, grabbing his neck. He chuckled. You're easy to deceive, aren't you? You can't attack me anymore, thanks to that contract. If you attack me, you'll be blinded. In fact, the ridiculous contract couldn't stop Yu Jin. He intentionally signed it to spare the guy's life, but he ended up attacking anyway. Yu Jin didn't bother to respond to his arrogant words. He just tore up the contract, looking at the guy coldly. The contract was nullified, terrifying the hunter C rank. The curse of silence was disabled by Yu Jin's skill making the guy horrified. Yu Jin grabbed his hand coldly, apologizing for shattering his dreams. This outcome is your choice. 
Then came the desperate screams of the hunter C rank. He no longer had a form, turning into a puddle of toxic water. Yu Jin calmly left to find the place where Pit was being held captive. Passing through other rooms, the kidnappers were still unconscious. Yu Jin spared them and returned to Breaky's cell. After all, Breaky died protecting him. Yu Jin turned him into a magical stone as he searched for the cage holding Pit, seeing Pit still sleeping. Yu Jin gently opened the door. If he took Pit away now, suspicions would arise about the deaths of Hunters B and C. Yu Jin sat down, embracing peace in his arms. Do you want to stay here with Daddy? While waiting for everyone to arrive, he looked at Peace with tender eyes. Yu Jin said cheerfully, You're fine. Don't worry. Don't die on me yet, okay? Maybe in the time of training and nurturing affection, what Yu Jin has for Peace isn't just as simple as owner and pet anymore. He continued to hold Peace close, and they both fell asleep on the boat. A few hours later, amidst the bustling footsteps of many, all from Abyss, searching anxiously, Yu Jin was still peacefully asleep, unaware until Yu Hun's proximity warning jolted him awake. Hastily receiving the news of Yu Jin's discovery, Yu Hun rushed to his side, helping his older brother up and inquiring about his condition. Yu Jin, trying to play it off, pretended to be tired, while Yim and Sung Han swiftly entered through a side door, bending the iron bars to reach Yu Jin. As Yu Jin stood up, his right leg still sore from the hunter's blow. He stumbled, and his younger siblings immediately rushed to support him. Where does it hurt? You eat it. Yim asked angrily. I'll go find and punch whoever did this to you to ease the tension. Despite the pain, Yujin managed to smile and reassured them. It's okay, it's okay, it's not that bad, I can still walk. However, they insisted on helping him, carrying their elder brother with utmost care, leaving bystanders astonished and admiring. Though grateful for the concern, Yu Jin couldn't shake off a sense of embarrassment as he was lifted into a car. He wanted to take his brother to the hospital for a checkup to be sure. The mention of the hospital made Yu Jin turn pale. He feared that all the secrets of Breaky's skills might be exposed there, which would remain active for another week. Despite his protests, his younger brother remained adamant. Resorting to his ultimate skill, Yu Jin put on a show of discomfort, expressing his reluctance to go to the hospital fearing encountering strangers or undergoing sedation or tests. His supreme skill didn't disappoint. Yu Han immediately took the hint, apologizing for being too cautious, and suggesting they head back. However, Yu Han remained uneasy, scrutinizing every corner of his older brother's body. Suddenly, with a stern expression, Yu Han said something that made Yu Jin slightly nervous. I feel something odd about you. There's a reptilian scent on you. Yu Jin quickly activated his hidden skill to conceal Breaky's smell before casually responding. Ah, it's probably the sea scent from crossing this embankment. Nonetheless, they continued home, relieved that they had passed this hurdle after a long, exhausting day. Temporarily stripped of their security clearance by the MKC, Yu Jin's abduction prompted tighter security measures, with new guards personally vetted by the chairman. However, the incident had a profound negative impact on Ming Yu whose self-doubt and sense of worthlessness resurfaced. Feeling utterly useless and unable to help, Miyoung Yu found himself crying in frustration, pounding the table helplessly, berating himself for his incompetence and inability to be of any use. It seemed that Yu Jin's recent kidnapping had deeply affected Miyoung Yu, making him feel like a surplus, worthless individual who didn't deserve to be by Yu Jin's side or offer any help. Feeling overwhelmed, Miyoung Yu left abruptly leaving Yu Jin worried sick. Despite Yu Hun's reassurances that Ming Yu might have just gone out for a while, Yu Jin was convinced that Ming Yu had truly left home. Concerned about his younger sibling's delicate nature, Yu Jin was afraid that someone might exploit Ming Yu and sell his organs in China, the first victim of the corrupt fund. As for Ming Yu, he wandered aimlessly under the streetlights, consumed by feelings of weakness and helplessness. Too ashamed to face Yu Jin for not daring to confront the situation and choosing to leave instead. However, even if Mian Yu wanted to return home, with his absent mind in nature, he would likely struggle to do so, becoming a wandering, inept, but well intentioned mess of a person. As he bent down and tied his backpack, clumsily fumbling with the straps, his belongings spilled out, symbolizing the chaotic state of his mind and his inability to keep everything together. While lamenting their fate and feeling sorry for themselves, two sisters stared at him, 
not recognizing him. They looked at Mi Young Yu's card and cheered excitedly. Ah, you were from the ABS Guild. Mi Young Yu, feeling embarrassed, confessed that he was just a dormitory caretaker for the guild, and even revealed that he was just a lackey for the boss. Instantly, Mi Young Yu got the attention of those around him, filled with curiosity. Unintentionally, he gained too much attention, leaving Mi Young Yu feeling confused. He mustered up the courage to admit, I'm just a lackey, and even if I woke up, Without combat skills, I'd be useless. This statement was like a sharp knife stabbing into Miao Yu's weak heart. The children's mocking remarks deepened Miao Yu's despair, imagining a scenario where he'd acquire 10,000 knives and still receive worthless skills, leading to abandonment by everyone, including Yu Jin. Miao Yu broke down in tears, and the children, frightened, blamed the older sister, who had provoked him. They wondered what to do next, and one suggested helping him. Taking Miyoung Yu's hand, she promised to help him acquire a valuable skill. This led to Miyoung Yu's first trials, enduring suffocation underwater and being pushed from the second floor, barely surviving each time. Despite the ordeal, Miyoung Yu continued to follow the children's lead, even though they were bullies. The next challenge involved crossing an eight-lane road with speeding cars. Miyoung Yu hesitated. But the girl insisted, explaining that the skill would only manifest in life-threatening situations. Despite Mia and Yu's shock, he realized the world had changed, favoring combat skills over education. As they contemplated advising the children, a loud explosion echoed, warning of a prison break in Gangnam, near where Mia and Yu and the children stood. While others followed, the children eagerly ran towards the prison, hoping to awaken their latent abilities. Left with no choice, Miao Yu followed them into the danger of the prison, where giant spider-like creatures raped havoc, leaving destruction in their wake. The buildings were all covered by dense spider webs. According to the field reporter, this was due to a winged biscuit formed within an abandoned shopping center due to not being detected in time, causing this prison explosion. The reporter on the helicopter was startled when he saw something. It was Miao Yu and two children rushing towards the explosion site. At this point, the three of them were surrounded by giant spiders. When the little boy started to panic, it was too late. They had ventured too far into danger. Those who couldn't evacuate in time were caught by the spiders as food reserves. Mia and Yu and the two children only knew to run for their lives. Contrary to the scared teenagers, the older sister was very tough. How could you freeze up here after coming all the way? She scolded. At this moment, a spider from the side appeared and lunged at them. The two children hugged each other, trembling and crying. The brave little girl stood up in front, spreading her arms to protect the trembling pair behind her. She appeared awakened, swinging her fists confidently. With a determined attitude, she would end it with a secret technique she could practice for many years. Watch this, you ugly spider, she shouted confidently. But suddenly, without any surprise, the giant spider effortlessly threw her away with its leg, causing her pain as she struggled to get up her face now filled with horror. She looked at her hands with desperate eyes. No, not like this. Not like this. The giant spider didn't let its prey escape, slowly approaching the girl again. It used its sharp, steel-like leg to strike fiercely towards Miao Yu, who gathered all his courage, holding the two children tightly, trying his best to run. Miao Yu wanted to take all three towards the rooftop of a building. If they could get there, it would be easier to contact the rescue team. Man Yu urged the boy to go by himself, while he carried the older sister, running as fast as he could. But with the overwhelming exhaustion, he could barely move a step. The girl still hasn't regained her spirits. She hugged her face, crying. Uncle, why did you leave me behind? My life is over, she sobbed. She had just woken up. It was all just coercion. It turns out she woke up and only resorted to coercion losing all confidence in herself with someone passionate about hunting. It was truly like a death sentence. Before she could climb any higher, the spider had already chased after them to the rooftop. They rushed up the stairs, but fear weighed on their legs like lead. No matter how hard they tried, the girl couldn't lift herself up again. I told you to leave me behind, but carrying me like this, you won't make it to the rooftop. I'm just a burden. My life is over. I don't have any fighting skills. I'm not worth risking your life for. Just leave me and run. The girl's bitter words made Miyunga release her, but he didn't run. Instead, he took a knife from his backpack, holding it firmly. 
He stepped down the stairs. Mingo wanted to shed blood to protect the two children. Though terrified, Mingu's actions showed extreme fear, yet his hand still gripped the knife tightly as he said to the two children, I'll hold it back. You two run ahead. Don't say such things, little ones. You shouldn't say such things as ending your lives or being abandoned. There are still many things you can do. Even if that's not the case, your lives still hold value. So don't sit there crying. Stand up and seek rescue. Then come back here, support each other well while running, okay? Mangu's words were like reassurance. So you don't want to be useless forever, do you? Protecting these two children is a courageous final act in your timid life. So, don't die, the two children are gone now. Please don't die, the shadow of Yu Jin suddenly appeared before Myungu's eyes. He was running on the wall upright. Myungu thought it was an illusion before his death. Thank you. I'm glad I could see you before I die. Every moment, you are getting closer to me, Mingu said, reaching out his hand eagerly. Yu Jin ran to him, and Myungu woke up abruptly from this coma, finding himself lying on the sofa in the dormitory. At the same time, the TV reported that the two children he was with had been safely rescued. Mayunga realized he wasn't fading away. He didn't remember how he returned to the dormitory. Eugene came in with a pot of chicken soup. Still, his demeanor showed he wasn't in a good mood. Mayunga asked about his rescue. Yesterday, just like those excavators, Eugene explained, I met a nightmare. You are a hunter from AB, rescuing and bringing home. Suddenly, Eugene grabbed Myungu's collar his voice full of anger. Anyway, you're reckless. Do you know how dangerous it was? Luckily, the news team accidentally captured and discovered it. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened? It's better not to think about leaving home anymore. Do you know how worried I was, thinking I wouldn't see you again? Though loud, it was all concerned for Myungu. Unable to hold back tears, Myungu cried tears of joy. Those tears washed away the burden in his heart, finally dissipating. Mangu finally spoke up. Even if I sharpened 10,000 knives and gained a useless skill, you'd still be my friend, he said. Eugene's expression remained displeased. I thought you were going to say something touching. But no, Eugene frowned. I thought we were having a serious conversation, but it turns out it's about you leaving home like this, he continued. Right now, I just want to punch this idiot a few times to relieve my frustration. Even without skills, you're doing fine. I heard you were admired by the equipment maintenance department a few days ago. Mingu said, grabbing Yu Jin's shoulder. I have a request. I don't think I can eat anyone else's food besides yours. So if you succeed, don't leave me, or at least visit often and cook for me, he added. These lines sound like they're from a BL novel. Mingu chuckled, surprised. Yu Jin continued the story. I promise I won't be picky. I'll even pay you. But it's best if you keep living with me, he said, expressing his concern. Mayungu smiled happily, agreeing. And just like that, Mayungu regained his trust in life. Hearing Yujin's caring words, 